Local 4 News starts now with a breaking news alert. We begin with breaking news out of Macomb County tonight with the city of Sterling Heights moving forward with a $1 billion plan that would drastically transform the Lakeside Mall site. Good evening. The once thriving mall along Hall Road would include demolishing much of the one and a half million square foot existing building. The mayor calling it the most valuable property in Sterling Heights, but don't expect ground to be broken anytime soon. Mar McDonald live outside tonight's council meeting that just wrapped up significant night for a city that has been looking Looking at how to get Lakeside redeveloped for years, Mara. Devin, that's right. In 5 2 vote tonight, they have signed a memorandum of understanding with a developer out of Miami that presented some pretty amazing concepts of what a new Lakeside will look like. Let me show you. Lakeside looks like this now, but what the developers are envisioning is a livable, walkable community with retail, office, residential, senior living, assisted living for seniors, restaurants, plenty of green space, and community buildings. The financing is multifaceted, and it includes the city of Sterling Heights bonding out for $45 million. $45 million. We're acting as a Wall Street bank to make sure that this project goes forward. Those bond monies would go for utilities, roads, and infrastructure that the city would continue to own and would be paid off with tax increment financing monies, not homeowners tax bills. Bond payments come in entirely from within the Lakeside project. So the way it works for those who aren't familiar is as the tax, the tax revenue will increase because they're going to be building and building and building. They're going to be invested at, at the end of this project. We anticipate that the, the, the total value of all the property and there will be around what $700 million. The renderings presented tonight are not something that is written in stone, but rather a concept that will change as the process goes along. And it's going to be a long build out, likely 12 years. Back here live, you know, when we talk about that build out, they did give a timeline for, you know, essentially what happens next. And the anticipation is that 2023 is going to be spent getting all these financing uh, components in place. You're likely, assuming everything is a go on the financing and things move ahead, you likely won't see any demolition of this property probably until 2025. We're live in Sterling Heights tonight. I'm Mara McDonald. Local four. No, Mara, sometimes I, I think we've reached a point where people hear mixed use. Their eyes kind of glaze over a little bit. It's become such a buzz <laughs> phrase. And we have seen public private partnerships end with uh, communities yeah. holding the bag before. We have. I mean, and, and they, you know, the council members themselves tonight referenced Allen Park with that failed movie venture yeah, that, that yeah. did not go well there. And they repeatedly asked their finance team, their finance team, the city finance team, what is the risk to the city of the Sterling Heights? And while the finance team, you know, essentially said this, look, every project is going to have risk, but this is minimal and there are stop gaps that are in place here that yep. the city is not going to be left holding See, the bag the need for the Back demand for you. safeguards in this day and age exactly all right mara now to a dramatic rescue in Ypsilanti Township, and it was all because one man refused to let his neighbor die. It happened back in late September when he went running into a home engulfed in flames. Our Pamela Osborne joins us live tonight. Pam, this is an incredible rescue story. It really is, and it actually brought tears to my eyes when we were interviewing DJ. He's the man who was rescued from that fire. He and his wife, they lost everything they owned in that fire, but there was something he said that really stuck out to me. That was the possessions they lost don't mean anything at all. It's all about life, what you do with it, how you live it, and he is alive today because of what his neighbor stepped up to do. It was September 30th. D. Bates was doing yard work at his Ypsilanti home when he heard his neighbors screaming about a fire. You see him here on ring doorbell video looking, then running towards the home. DJ Albert was inside. He walked into the living room and there was a haze of smoke. When he walked into the bedroom, he found the mattress on fire. At first, he thought he could put it out himself. I was just Coming overcome with smoke and flood flames. At this point, he had been burned. Then darkness set in. I couldn't get out on my own. I've had some strokes, some health issues. Albert says he found a pocket of air on his living room floor right next to the piano. This is where he was lying when Bates rushed in to help. Front door was open. I heard the guy yelling. 
I ran in, had to come back out within five seconds because it was so smoky. After catching his breath, Bates ran back inside, guided only by the sound of Albers' voice growing fainter from smoke inhalation. Found him on the floor and grabbed him. I said, come on, let's go. He said, I can't walk. And I said, all right, hold on. And just, I just pulled him out. Angel from Mercy came in and rescued me from the fire. And I understand that he had come in and was pushed back by the flames and the fire once. And he was outside and he said, I couldn't let this guy die. And he came in and dragged me to safety. His gratitude echoed by officials in Ypsilanti Township who presented Bates with an award at Tuesday night's meeting. The two men who'd never met before that day tell me they're more than friends. They're like family. I mean, how do you thank somebody for saving your life? There's no, we gave him the Zingerman's basket and a bottle of wine. How nice is that, you know? You can't, I'll never be able to repay him for his, for his bravery and his heroism. I just thought I did a good thing. I felt like I did something I would want anyone to do for anyone, anywhere, because that's the way the world should be. And it should be. Albert did spend several days in the burn unit at U of M Hospital. He is still recovering, but as you heard there, he is just so incredibly, incredibly grateful to be alive. Reporting live tonight in Ypsilanti, I'm Pamela Osborne. Local four. You could hear his voice cracking. He was so emotional. And and the other gentleman saying, you know, I just did what anyone would do. Not that's not always the case. So what a great not rescue always. story. Thank you, Pam. The way the world should be. Yeah. A 19 year old is charged in the case of a body found in the back of a pickup truck after an accident in Roseville. This is quite a story. Stephen Freeman charged with concealing the death of an individual and also receiving and concealing stolen property. Police say he was the driver in the accident that led to the discovery of that body of 62 year old Gabrielle Seats last Thursday. Now, her cause of death has not been confirmed. Investigators are working to determine the relationship between Freeman and Cease. Obviously, the investigation is ongoing, and it was never a simple traffic stop from our perspective, <laughs> right? It was brought to us with these facts already known, but identifying the relationship of the parties, identifying uh, what led to her, her passing uh, is going to take some time. Stephen Freeman pleaded not guilty today to all charges against him. A high school hall monitor is charged with sexually assaulting students in Warren. Prosecutors say 22-year-old Jaron Johnson has several victims at Lincoln High School. One case involved inappropriate contact with a 14-year-old girl on school property. He's facing eight counts of criminal sexual conduct. Van Dyke Public Schools says he was fired after the allegations first surfaced. The district says they are cooperating with the investigation. Family of Porter Burks, the man fatally shot by Detroit police during a mental health call, is suing the department. The $50 million lawsuit filed by attorney Jeffrey Feiger names Detroit police and five unnamed Detroit police officers. Police maintain the 20 year old Burks would not put a knife down when they opened fire. 38 bullets were fired, 19 hit Burks. Feiger says police knew Burks, knew his struggles, and did not have to open fire on him. There must have been a thousand different things that could have been done other than shooting him. And the one and only thing they did was, I see a video where a man's holding out his hand, and then they shoot him. Detroit Police Chief James White releasing a statement today, reading in part the department reiterates that the shooting of Porter Burks was truly a tragic event. The department will continue to advocate for greater resources for the mental health community and will take every opportunity to improve its response to people suffering from mental illness. Michigan State University announcing tonight it has suspended four more football players in connection with the fight that broke out inside the tunnel at the Big House Saturday night. The newly suspended players are Jacoby Winman, Brandon Wright, Justin White, and Malcolm Jones. So that makes eight Spartans now suspended. Today we also heard from several U of M players for the first time since Saturday night. And Bernie will have their reaction and how they plan to try to move past the incident coming up tonight in sports just ahead. Detroit City Council rejecting a proposed restaurant grading ordinance. So it would have required restaurants to post a color coded health inspection rating in their front windows. But today it was rejected down by a six to three vote. Members voiced concerns over putting heavier workloads on already burdened health department inspectors. So they have approved an additional $200,000 to the Detroit's health department's budget to hire more.